So today I want to give you some practical things about how to pray, but I'm going to tell you a quick July 4th story. July 4th, when I was in college, I got to come home for a few days, and my brother-in-law had been to South Carolina, home of legal fireworks. And now you can buy them here, you just have to say you're a train worker or a farmer, scaring things. Oh, by the way, when I was up north too... If you light fireworks off on July 5th or July 3rd, they give you a $250 ticket up north. So that's probably a good idea for Florida. I'm just saying, people in Port St. John, about a month from now, you'll be saying, it is still not July 4th. Anyway, my my Port St. John fellows have told me about their plight. Uh, Anyway, so so we come home, and my brother-in-law, they want to have a bottle rocket fight. So my dad was a construction worker, so we all got goggles. And, you know, we're in college, so we're invincible. So, so, you know, we're launching fireworks. Well, my brother-in-law thinks he's going to be smart, and he went up in, we had a tree fort. My dad was a contractor, so he built this huge 10 by 10 tree fort that was way up in the tree. We had the first zip line. You remember, uh, remember zip lines? My dad had a, we did that as a kid, and the stopping place was the tree. And uh, so we went from about two and a half stories up into a pine tree. Uh, if you didn't get your feet down fast enough. And as you can tell, I hit my head a couple of times. So my brother-in-law decides, we're, we're shooting bottle rockets at each other. My brother-in-law decides that the safest place is going to be in that tree fort. So he's up in that tree fort shooting down at us, which was a really good position until I was able to fire a bottle rocket up and it went in the window and bounced around. And all I could see was shadows of him going, ah! That was the awesomest 4th of July ever. That was, by the way, we didn't do that ever again. After that, all the burns on our legs and everything else. And at home, I just want to say, I'm not encouraging this behavior. (laughs) Young man, I'm not encouraging this behavior. No, Matthew's behind you. He's... You're an adult. If you want to fire bottle rockets at somebody, you're the one who goes to jail. But, uh, you know. Anyway, but it's good to see you guys today. It's great to have you here. Listen, let me ask you a question. Do you want to see God answer prayers? And here's the second question. Would you even know if God answered your prayer? Here's why I say that. Some of us are so busy just launching prayers that we've never thought to write them down or to pray for something specific or to put something down that we say, God, I really want to see you do this. And then my third question is this, do you really know what spiritual warfare is? What does that mean? A lot of these terms are way out here. And so today I want to give you just some practical ways to look at prayer, which can help you. And here's the pattern we've looked at. Now, there's many ways to pray. You can pray using the Lord's Prayer. That's an easy way to pray. Uh, Acts, there's other ways. Uh, uh, I use a prayer called the Tabernacle Prayer. Maybe someday I'll teach on that. Um, That's one of my favorites, too. Um, But we use Acts. It's an easy one. You can do it in the car. Uh, A for adoration. That's when you just rest in God's presence. You recognize who he is. And in that, you recognize who you're not. And then confession. Biggest part of confession. Ready? Not only receiving forgiveness, but as he referred to earlier, Rodney. By the way, great job, Rodney. As Rodney referred to earlier, you also have to forgive others. That's in the Lord's Prayer. And then last week, Steve talked about thanks. Giving. By the way, Steve's going to be one of our newest pastors to be ordained here in the next couple of months. We're excited. Only problem is everybody else who is a pastor that's come to our church, we've sent three out already to other churches. So we've already told Steve, if we ordain you, you can't leave and uh, we take it away. I don't, I don't know that we can do that. But anyway, uh, but he did a great job last week and I hope you enjoyed that. I actually listened to his message live in Seattle uh, at six o'clock in the morning, Seattle time. And uh, Did you know it's a different time out there? They've changed the time. And the heat. I I had to come back to Florida to cool off. 109 when I left Seattle. And then finally, today we're going to talk about supplication. And um, you ever see one of these? If you haven't gotten one of these yet, you're too tall. Bill, you don't need one of these, okay? Maybe if your back starts to hurt, you you, you might need it for down here, right? But the truth is, some of us need this all the time. This is a little grabber thing. And what does it do? It lets you get something you can't get. Can I tell you something about prayer? Prayer lets you accomplish things. Prayer allows you to talk to God. Prayer allows you to have power that you can't have on your own. You can't reach God. Did you know that? 
But the Bible says, through the Holy Spirit, because of the death of Jesus Christ, because of His blood shed for us, you and I are able to reach out to God and have a relationship with Him. Not because of anything we've done, but because of what He's done. So I want to give you three keys today to supplication. Number one, surrender your fears and desires. Now, Paul in this book is addressing two ladies who had a fight. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a fight that was embarrassing, but I, years ago, had a couple, right after church, get in a fight in the lobby of the church. In the lobby of the church. Let me just say that again. Don't fight in the lobby. Parking lot is what that's for. Not lo- Anyway, got in a fight, wife got in the car, peeled out of the driveway, it was, I was so embarrassed for, and it was over, of course, something dumb. I was so embarrassed for both of them. Okay? Now, Paul wrote both of these women's names down in the Bible. When people get to heaven, they go, are you that lady? And she's like, oh, why did he put my name in there? Right? I mean, talk about embarrassing. So he's talking about this fight that's going on. Let me tell you something that happens when you begin to pray. You have a fight. And you think of spiritual warfare as this way out thing. Let me, let me tell you something. As soon as you start to pray, all of your fears are going to attack you. Listen to me. When you start to pray, that person that said something to you 10 years ago, it's going to come back in your mind. Everything that could go wrong. This is part of spiritual warfare. You need to realize what is the enemy trying to do. He doesn't have to destroy you. He just has to distract you. He doesn't have to destroy. All he's got to do is get you. He doesn't want you to pray. So, so what's the part of the spiritual warfare? It's what's going on up here. The enemy comes and throws. By the way, I always t- have a piece of paper with me when I sit down to pray. Because my to-do list starts when I pray, too. I think of everything I need to get done. Those aren't evil things, right? But those things can distract you from what's best. And that's all the enemy needs to do. So you write those things down. And, listen... As you surrender your fears, you surrender your desires to God. This is what you want to see because, remember, part of what happened is those plans, things you want to do as you start to pray for people. The enemy doesn't want you to pray for people. So what does Paul say here in Philippians? He says, rejoice in the Lord once in a while. Occasionally. When times are good. When you like everybody. When everybody's happy. By the way, anybody have everybody in their life happy? Anybody? I just, just making sure, right? It's always somebody not happy, right? Rejoice in the Lord. Listen, always. And I love this. I'll say it again. Rejoice. I love that. You got to realize back then, paper and pen was expensive. It was difficult to write. You were writing it and then rewriting it. The Bible has been carried down to us accurately for thousands of years. They've gone back. They have found versions and copies of Scripture within 50 years of when they were written. It was difficult to write. And yet he thought it was so important, he wrote it twice. Now, you don't think a thing about writing something twice. But back then, let me tell you something. They did. So Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice, it's pretty important. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Did you know that most people in the world don't think of Christians as gentle? Do you hear me? Paul says we should be known by our gentleness. This means, there's two words that this means in the Greek. It means to be sweet and reasonable. Sweet and reasonable. You know what reasonable means? It means You can reason with them. It means you actually use your brain. All right, here we go. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And then I love this. The Lord is near. You know what he's saying there? You think that you're gossiping about somebody and they don't know about it. But God's close by. You think you're saying those negative things and nobody knows. But God is near. You think that you're doing something that no one notices. But God is near. You think you're volunteering and serving everybody and nobody cares. But the Lord is near. And then it continues. Do not be anxious about most things. No, do not be anxious about anything. And this is part of that spiritual battle. You have to surrender that anxiety. But in every situation, how do you do it? By prayer 
and petition. And by the way, this word for petition is also translated supplication, which is not a word we use often. It, it just means an earnest desire, a heart desire. And then it says, with thanksgiving. By the way, you can only pray in thanksgiving when you're praying in faith. Because you're saying, God, no matter what happens, I know you're going to take care of it. Thank you for taking care of it. You know, when you're in the hospital and you're looking out the window and you're watching the sunset and you realize there's a tube down your throat and you realize, you know what, I'm not sure I'm going to make it out of this hospital, but God, thank you for the sunset and that you'll always take care of me. That was one of my prayers when I was in the hospital for 30 days with a tube down my throat. The doctor didn't think I was going to live. By the way, I got to see that doctor just a few weeks ago. He came in, he said, oh, every time I pass that room, I think of you. And I'm thinking, that's really bad. A doctor who can remember 10 years ago which room you were in because he thought you were going to die. Thanks, Doc. It's good to see you too. Present your request to God and what will happen? The peace of God. Do you have that this morning? Do you have the peace of God with you this morning? By the way, anytime you feel that leave, that's also spiritual warfare. If the enemy can take your peace away from you, then you won't live as a Christian. Jesus went to the cross, listen to this, in peace. That didn't mean it wasn't a struggle. It didn't mean it wasn't difficult. But he walked in God's peace. When he was attacked by people, he still had God's peace. Do you know what the Romans, when they would kill Christians, one of the things they hated is the look on Christians' faces. A look of peace. Why? They had surrendered everything to God. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, what will it do? It will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The number one way to fight spiritual warfare is to surrender and trust God. Because the enemy, when you surrender to God, the enemy can't plant seeds of doubt. He can't plant seeds of discouragement. He can't plant seeds of fear and frustration and anger. Why? Because, God, you're going to do this. This is what Abraham Lincoln prayed years ago. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We've been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. We have started to think as a country that somehow we've done it instead of recognizing all the miracles God has done. As we celebrate July 4th, I know we're not supposed to worship our country but we should worship the God who gives us freedom. All the miracles it took for us to even be here today. The world's system will always, always, always lead to a lack of freedom. And so we need to pray, God, would you humble us? Father, forget the way that we are prideful and arrogant and think that we have it all together. Forgive us for our sins and hurts and arrogance. As we begin to do that, this will happen. So what do we do? We present our requests and we trust Him. When's the last time you prayed and as soon as you prayed, you worried about it? Let me tell you something about praying. When you pray to God sometimes, when you're going through a struggle, you know what this is? It's a river rock. You ever, you ever look, and I'm sorry I don't have a big one, you ever look at the difference between a regular rock and a river rock? You know what the biggest difference is? Smooth edges. And people talk about how the water smoothed it, and that's true. But you know what smoothed out this rock? Bumping up against other rocks. You know what's going to smooth out your life? Bumping up against other people. Most of your difficulties are not going to be just out in the, the atmosphere. They're going to be that person who did this, who said that, that family member who can't straighten out, that difficulty that happened, that hurt that happened, that strain that happened, that pain that happened. And what is God doing? He's going to use all of those things for his good. To make you a person that other people look at and they go, wow, look at their grace. How can they walk in freedom with everything they've been through? Why? Because you've allowed God to work on the edges. Realize that when you're praying, what's God doing? He's allowing his spirit 
to smooth the edges of your life. Number two, sensitivity to the Holy Spirit brings power. I want to encourage you to pause when you pray. I saw the movie uh, uh, years ago called Bringing Up Baby. You may have no idea what that is, but it's Katherine Hepburn and uh, Cary Grant. And if you want to be aggravated by a movie, watch that movie. Because here's the deal. Katherine Hepburn, the entire movie doesn't let anyone talk. The whole movie. She doesn't learn from beginning to end. She talks over everybody. She talks through everybody. They can't get a word in edgewise, and she just talks over them. By the way, when it came out, it flopped. You know why? Because Katherine Hepburn drove everybody crazy. Great movie, by the way. A lot of us pray that way. God, I want this. 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 Fix this. Do this. Do this. Do this. See you later. Bye. I want to encourage you to pause when you pray. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption and sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, which means Daddy, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings so that we may share in his glory. What's he saying? You can come before God with confidence, not because of you. If you go to prayer and you think, I got to do a bunch of stuff for God to listen to me. I got to get a bunch of stuff right for God to get. I got to, man, if God, if you'll do this, you know, you can be like uh, uh, that movie where he says, God, if you, if you save me, uh, uh, I'll give you half my income. You know, and then he gets onto shore. If I have time, right? And then Dom DeLuise starts chasing him down the beach. 100%, I'll give you everything, right? We think that it, by giving, somehow God, listen, he loves you. He cares about you. When you're God's child, when you surrender to Him, He says, you can come boldly before the throne. I love what Max Lucado says about prayer. Our prayer may be awkward. Anybody ever feel awkward when they pray? Come on now. I do, so you better. Right? I'm like, man, I... But guess what? God's not worried about that. Our prayer may be awkward, our attempts may be feeble, but since the power of prayer is the one who is in the one who hears it and not the one who says it, our prayers make a difference. You don't have to pray like that lady. That's great that she can pray that way. I love people that can pray that way. I love people that can pray in power. But guess what? Your help is a great prayer. Your Lord, take care of my friend is a wonderful prayer. In Ephesians 6, it says this, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. What? How, do you, how can you be alert during prayer? I'm going to talk about that in a second. Always keep on praying for the Lord's people. Pray also for me. That whenever I speak, words may be given me, so I will be fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I could. So Paul's saying, hey, pray that I would be fearless. By the way, I would love you to pray that for me. You don't have to pray the chain part, but, but pray that I would be fearless. And as I share the gospel with people, I got to pray with the guy who cut down one of our trees the other day. He came and he said, hey, would you pray for my crew before we cut it down? One of his friends had died the day before. And so I gathered them around and I prayed for that whole crew. I want to encourage you to make a list of people to pray for. I don't care how you do it. I've got my iPad, which I meant to bring up here. I've got an app on my iPad for prayer. I've got a prayer list in there. I don't care if you write it on a sheet of paper, put everybody's name. I don't care if you, like Rodney, who used to be, is one of our pastors here, uh, if you put it on a little card and put it in your wallet. I don't care if you put it on your dash in your car. I don't care if you put it on your mirror in your back. But start to write some things you're praying for. Why? So that you can know when they're answered. So that you can see what God is doing day after day. So with that in mind, I want you to do something right now. I want you to bow your heads right where you're at. And I want you to ask God to put somebody on your heart to pray for. It may not be somebody you've thought of in a long time. And I just want you to take a moment, whether you're at home or here, Take a moment and lift that person up and pray whatever you sense God's putting on your heart. Father, we lift all these folks up in Jesus name. Amen. Now, I want to encourage you to do something this afternoon. Sometime this afternoon, you can send them a text. You can make a phone call. You can send them a letter with a stamp on it. I, I, I tell you, you could fax them, but I don't think anybody has a fax machine anymore. 
But send them a note and just say, I just want you to know I was praying for you. I cannot tell you the number of times that during my prayer time, I was praying for, for Bobby Sue. And Lord, help Bobby Sue. And all of a sudden, as I got still, the Lord put somebody else on my mind or in my heart. And I said, you know, I'm going to let them know I was praying for them. And I can't tell you the number of times somebody said to me, how did you know I got a doctor's report today? How did you know I was headed in for this procedure today? I just said, because I'm really smart. And then they laugh, just like you just did. Thanks a lot. You can be confident that God will lead you as you pray. You just got to get still. Prayer does not change God, but it changes him who prays. Number three, seek his will in all things. Jesus in the garden said, God, this is what I want, but your will be done. I can tell you this, every year I lose a friend. Every year. Every year I'm at the hospital. I may be at a bedside. I was at a bedside earlier this year praying with somebody who's dying. And I pray the same way all the time. I say, Lord, you know what I want. I want them to be healed. I want them to be better. I want them to walk away. But God, I'm not in charge. So your will be done. That's a hard prayer of faith to pray. Especially when it's somebody you care about. When it's really somebody that you love and care about and you want them to stay forever. Did you know what? God, this is what I want. But your will be done. I want to encourage you to pray. Your will be done. First John, it says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so you may know that you have eternal life. That's a great place to start. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will. Did you hear that part? People leave that out. They think you can just pray for anything you want. If you pray the right way, if you use the right words, if you use the right incantation, pray the way I say to pray and you'll be okay. No. Pray in his will. He hears us, and if we know he hears us, whatever we ask, we know we've had what we've asked of him. Remember, the confidence is in him, not in you. When you come before God in prayer, you don't have to be afraid, it says. Why? Because of you? No, you're messed up. But you've surrendered your life to Christ. So when you come as a Christian to him, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. And you come as a child of God, bringing your request to him. So finally, surrender all of your desires and will to him. If you go to my office next door, you'll see a big framed amazing grace that somebody who went to Northwest gave to me that their dad had made. It's a beautiful version of that. And on the side of it are two pictures. One's a picture of a couple being baptized and the other's picture of that same couple getting married. But you don't know part of the story. This couple was Ricky's Boy Scout leaders of their troop. And they were not Christians. And they were living together and they were far from God not going to church. And I began praying for them. And one day, uh, and by the way, she told me I could tell this story. One day, the lady showed up in church, and she came to me, and she said, I just want you to know, my counselor said, church will help me with my anger issues. That's the first time I've ever had somebody tell me that. I came to church because I'm mad, right? That's a good start. And I, okay. It wasn't too many months until she gave her life to Christ, and her living boyfriend gave his life to Christ. And a few months later on Cocoa Beach, they got married. And they're still married, and people come to me all the time when I tell them about these, this couple, and they say, I've seen God do amazing things in her life. She's a different person than I ever knew. He's always been nice, so. <laughs> it's amazing grace. Do you have anybody you can look back and go, I prayed for them? I've got a special place in my phone when somebody gives me a request that's big and I can tell when it's big. Somebody just recently said, can you pray for my two kids? They're having a hard time. I put their name in my calendar part of my phone where it pops up at the top and I pray for them every time I see it. There's all kinds of ways to pray, but take time to pray. Why? So you can see what God's been doing. Prayer isn't this huge, mysterious thing. It's you talking to your heavenly father. You can't reach him on your own. But through the Holy Spirit, because of the blood of Jesus, you get a power that you don't have on your own. So pray. Take time to pray. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and then today, supplication. Take time to pray for others. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. 
I'd love to talk to you about after the service about what it means to surrender to him. Maybe you know about Jesus. Maybe you understand Jesus. Maybe you, you may be the strongest, most biblically literate person in here, but you've never surrendered your life to him. You can do that today. Jesus, I want to give you my life. I know you died for my sins and rose again, and I surrender my way of living to you. Maybe as a Christian today, the truth is you've been walking in your own power. You like things the way you do them. And maybe it's time to say, God, forgive me for trying to do things my way. I want to do things your way. This is a good time to do that. We're going to have our time of prayer. Normally we have our offering. In a few weeks, we'll start passing the offering plate again. But right now, you can give online or you can give on your way out. If you're watching online, you can give that way too. Thanks for coming this morning. Happy Fourth of July. Let's pray. Father, we do. We thank you for our country. But Father, even greater, we thank you for your love for us. You've given us so much, Father. And honestly, we're not appreciative of all we have. And so, Father, forgive us for not being grateful sometimes. And, Father, forgive us for looking and worrying about the wrong things when you have given us so much. Father, we surrender our will to your will today, and we pray for those who you put on our hearts. Father, teach us to pray through your Spirit. Put people on our hearts, put things on our hearts to pray for And Father, show us also what we need to do about those very things. We trust you, Lord. Thank you for these moments. In Jesus' name, amen.